everyone, welcome to today's episode. Today we are very lucky to have Dr. Anna Robis. She's with us somewhere behind the scene, and she has a PhD from nutritional science. She's also a former athlete, and she's very active. She exercises every day. Uh, before I move on, make sure you check the description below or the detail. Uh, my website confidenceperformance.com if you like to have the free course it is performance confidenceperformance.com slash free course and also check uh, Dr. Anna Robbie's information down in the description as well as the blood test link if you like to go for a blood test let's learn from today's episode it is about why do athletes should go for a regular blood test why is it important how should we do that? So let's invite Dr. Roby to be with us. Hold on. Hi, Dr. Anna Roby. Welcome. Hi. Thank you so it. much for having me. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and experience. Yeah, we are all very excited to hear from you. Uh, also to hear from your research finding, why it is important to have blood tests and what kind of blood tests should we do or should the athlete do and who should we go to and so on. So first of all, I would like you to introduce yourself because I think if when you introduce yourself, you can tell more about yourself. Well, I appreciate <laughs> that. So um, I'm Dr. Anna Roby and I am a registered dietitian and an exercise physiologist. I have a background in um, exercise physiology and also nutritional sciences. And, and after my undergraduate degree, I got my bachelor's degree at Cornell University. I went on to do a combined um, PhD in registered dietitians combined program. So I was able to do my internship to get my registered dietitians credentials while I was working on research and get my doctorate. So I studied um, human metabolism and so I'm really interested in how the human body works, especially in the context of exercise. So I'm really interested in how exercise influences how your body works, and that also affects your blood. So we'll get into that more today. And after that, I went on and did some research at the National Institutes of Health, or the NIH, um, out in Bethesda, Maryland. And I worked there for a while doing some human trials. And then I started my private practice. And I also began working with athlete blood test where I'm now their chief research officer. So I'm really interested in working with the athletes, trying to figure out what's going on with their blood, with their bodies, and how we can get humans to essentially perform their best in an athletic context. So I'm really excited to be here with you today. And we can chat all about the good, the bad, and the blood. Wonderful, wonderful. I wish I uh, met you before, you know, when I was an athlete, uh, before this time. I wish I know someone who is really uh, expert or specialized in nutritional uh, physiologies and nutritional science so that I can ask for more opinion. The reason why I said that, because when I was an athlete, I competed at the 1992 Olympic Games. Prior to that, I won the Asian Championship and won many other international uh, medals, gold medals at the Southeast Asia Games for four times consecutively. I worked so hard. I pushed myself so hard, especially when you are a student athlete. So I was a student athlete. I did not take time off from my studies. I studied and compete at the same time, like, hand in hand without any time off or any uh, gap year. I didn't take any mm -hmm. gap year. I just moved on hand in hand, you know, studies and competition and training. At the same time, it was really, really uh, hard, but I persevere. But at the same time, when I push myself, I persevere. I knew that I have very strong mental skill, strong mentally, but then I felt that sometimes my body just cannot follow. You know, even though you have... A very strong mind sometimes your body has to follow even though you can use your brain to control your body somehow physiologically you may not able to handle right that's why i think it, the importance of blood test comes in yeah yeah so uh, before i move on to share more about my stories i would like to learn from you and then in between i'm going to share with you what happened to my blood test so how about you tell me more about why should we do blood tests like why should athletes do blood tests and how often should they go for blood tests? Yeah, so blood testing is a fairly new, I guess, phenomenon in 
the athletic world outside of like professionals. So professionals and Olympians have had access to blood testing for quite a while now, but it's only, you know, been fairly recently that athletes can now go and get their blood tested who are just, you know, exercising recreationally. Maybe they don't even identify as an athlete. They're just going to the gym. Well, I say just going to the gym, but they're exercising, you know, maybe five, four, five, six days a week. And that's definitely going to affect their body, their physiology and how it's working. And so we have really worked on bringing the science to athletes now. So it's really important because we don't know what we don't know, right? And so when you are exercising, when you're training, whether you identify as an athlete or not, um, your body is changing. And that's part of what makes us fitter and faster and stronger is that our bodies change and they adapt. But what's interesting is that's going to affect, you know, your blood work. And so as an athlete or someone who's exercising, you want to see kind of how your training volume or your training load is affecting your body and how it's functioning. You know, how is your nutrition supporting your body? Are you getting enough of the right vitamins and minerals? Are you training too much or maybe not enough? Are you you know, getting what you need to be supporting what you're asking your body to do. And so that's reflected in your blood values because at athletebloodtest.com, what we do is we look at a very comprehensive panel of blood work. So we'll look at hydration, um, recovery. We'll look at, you know, your training tolerance. We'll look at micronutrients. So you really get to see a good picture about kind of what is your body doing in response to what you're asking it to do and what you're giving it in terms of its nutrition. And so it's really important to see how that's panning out because like I said, we usually don't know what we don't know. And so you could be low in several things or maybe high in certain things, but you don't necessarily have symptoms yet. And so it's really important to see, you know, how is your body handling this? And if that means preventing something catastrophic down the road in terms of like a deficiency or potentially an injury, that can be really helpful to sort of circumvent and get away from, you know, some potential downsides of being out of an ideal range for certain nutrients. So it's really important um, as an athlete, especially someone who's competing to make sure that your body is sort of in the best shape that it can be. Because in a lot of sports, we can, you know, spend money on certain things. So you can buy the fanciest running shoes or the fastest bike. Um, but unless you have, you know, a good foundation in terms of your body and your physiology, you're never going to be able to do your best. And so we really want to help athletes achieve their best um, and enjoy their sport along the way too. Because a lot of times we don't see signs and symptoms until you get really far outside of that um, ideal range. So it's important to make sure that you're taking care of your body um, and making sure that it's sort of um, up to what you're asking it to do. And wow. then you also, you asked about um, timing and mm -hmm. it kind of depends on the individual, but there are a few times that you definitely want to get your blood checked. The first would be sort of in a baseline situation. So like in the off season, for example, maybe you're not training very much. You're just sort of exercising to stay in shape, um, but it's not your competitive season. This is important because it's going to establish a baseline for you. So we can see where you kind of naturally fall when your body's not stressed with the exercise. So maybe, for example, you tend to run a little high in some things and a little low in others, and that's just your body's happy place. Then we can see that in the blood work. Um, and so we want to see kind of where you're at without that, that layer of exercise on top. And then, then another time would be about six weeks into like a heavy training season. So mm -hmm. to see how your body is handling your training load. And then you also want to get checked about six weeks before your A competition, whether that's a race, a meet, you know, um, any sort of competition that's really important to you, because this allows us to make any changes to supplements or nutrition, recovery, that sort of thing. Um, in order to kind of get you into an ideal range for these biomarkers before you go into your important competition. So it depends on the athlete. If you're not competitive, I usually recommend people get tested seasonally. So about once every three months, just to make sure that your body's getting what it needs and you're supporting it in what you're asking it to do. Very interesting. So that, Every six months or every three months, we should go for blood tests just to see where you stand. And what do you think about the the, the timing of the blood test? Like I uh, timing, I meant period of time of the day. Like should we go blood test? Oh, sure. 
in the afternoon or in the evening for me uh, as a regular uh, patient of my family doctor uh, they recommended my uh, they recommended me to go for blood test in the morning with empty stomach so as an athlete when is the best time yeah so i would agree with your your physician um, usually we recommend that people get their blood drawn first thing in the morning after an easy day or a recovery day this way we're not going to see some artifacts of a workout that you just did so for example if you do a really hard workout and then you go and get your blood drawn we might see some things that look a bit strange and really your body's just fine but it's you know it looks a little different because you just exercised so if you can get it done first thing in the morning um, after like an easier day we're less likely to see some of these artifacts from a workout show up in the blood work itself and by doing it in the morning it gives us a little bit of consistency too because we have what's called the circadian rhythm which is our body's natural kind of ebb and flow of certain um, nutrients and certain um, bioactive compounds within the body or different hormones so for example cortisol our stress hormone that tends to be highest in the morning and then decrease throughout the day and so by testing earlier on in the morning especially in a fasted state so you haven't eaten you're not going to see some of these um, perturbations that might be a remnant of what you've done that day. Um, maybe you had a really stressful day at, at work or you know you ate lunch really late or something like that that could potentially influence um, the blood test results. So first thing in the morning is usually best um, you know, and just kind of get it out of the way too so that way you can eat breakfast and kind of go on about your day. Yeah, that's good to know, first thing in the morning. And for from your experience, have you seen many high performance athlete take blood tests uh, nowadays compared to last time long long time ago how often yeah it is getting much more common we're seeing a lot more people who don't necessarily identify as like a top end athlete um, but definitely those who are pretty competitive are getting blood tested i would say fairly regularly um, it kind of depends on their season but yeah i would say about every you know maybe 12 weeks or so um, to see how their blood looks in terms of nutrients, how it's handling the training, you know, do they need to increase their training volume or back off? Those types of things um, are really important, especially for the athletes. Uh, what did you find uh, in comparison with the high-performance athlete versus the uh, recreational athlete? I don't know how many recreational athletes will go for blood tests, but if, you, if they do, uh, do you see any differences in terms of their blood sample? Yeah, it's a good question. So we tend to see a difference in terms of training load. So typically the higher end athletes who are training like hours a day, every day, we're going to see different levels in their blood for certain biomarkers um, because their body is under more stress. But what's interesting is, so let's say we get someone who's a, a top end athlete and they're working with us for the first time, we might see a lot of things that are out of range. Um, and then we have actually a runner who is, she just qualified for the Olympic trials and now she's been working with us for years. And her first blood test, there were a lot of things that were out of range. Um, and you know, it was kind of a joke in terms of like, oh, there's a lot of things to work on here. But because she's tested with us, you know, every couple of months for the past few years, now, you know, after a few blood tests, she was able to really kind of refine her nutritional strategy, her training, her recovery, any supplements that she needed. So now it's more of a matter of maintenance. And so we see like, oh, well, you know, basically keep doing what you're doing or maybe making small tweaks here or there. So at first, I think, you know, some of these top end athletes, they start out with a lot of things that they need to be working on, but it's really easy for them to sort of get within that ideal range. Not all the time though. I've seen some top athletes who, in, in some professionals too, where they have a full team. So they have a sports psychologist, they have a dietitian, you know, they have a, a whole team that's supporting them. And that makes it a little bit easier for them to get all of their needs met versus someone who's recreational, who has a full-time job, they have kids and they're trying to train on top of all of this. So it kind of depends on the person, you know, their training volume and sort of how much they have to uh, support their needs in terms of recovery, nutrition and training. Well, good to know. And what do you think about the blood samples detail? So what kind of blood sample do you always, or you know, recommend or suggest the high performance athlete to take 
or, or do you think the rec recreational athlete should take the same exact uh, blood sample? Uh, what I mean is blood sample that consists uh, of maybe vitamin D testing, maybe uh, iron testing, something like that. Yeah. So I would I would agree that the recreational athlete and the kind of higher elite athlete, they should be taking the same blood test because you're, you know, you're putting a stress on your body with the exercise, which we know is beneficial in the long term. But again, if you're moving your body consistently, your body is going to be changing and adapting. And so we want to see how your body's changing and adapting in terms of what it needs and make sure that it's being supported with that. So we look at a lot of different biomarkers. And I recommend if someone is starting out for the first time to get what's called the gold panel. And it's very comprehensive. And it looks at a lot of things related to training, recovery and nutrition. So you get all of these components versus just going to the doctor. They might not necessarily look as much at a comprehensive approach compared to what we're doing. Um, and so this is going to look at red blood cells to see how are they functioning, right? So do they look like they're a good size or they're the right number, that sort of thing, because your red blood cells or what's going to help, you know, give your muscles and the working tissue that fresh oxygen and carry out those waste products. So we'll also look at white blood cells, which is kind of a reflection of your immune system, your immune health, um, hydration, micronutrients, um, and training tolerance as well. And so there's a lot that goes into, you know, a well functioning body for an athlete. And so you want to make sure that you have a well rounded approach to be supporting different facets of your needs, instead of just looking at micronutrients, for example. Well, what do you mean by micronutrient? Also, what is a goal panel? So the goal panel, so if you go to athletebloodtest.com, you'll see that they have different panel offerings. So mm -hmm. the goal panel is kind of our comprehensive one that I would recommend people start with. So um, it'll make more sense if you look on the website, you'll see the different offerings that they have. So I would say that that's, um, you know, a good place to start. But in terms of the micronutrients, so these are going to be vitamins and minerals that we look at. And so iron is like kind of a separate section, but we do include that in the gold panel as well. So we look at both serum iron, as well as your stored iron known as ferritin. So um, in addition to that, we also look at, you know, vitamin D, vitamin B12, folate, potassium, magnesium, uh, sodium. And so there's a lot of different vitamins and minerals that are important to make sure that you're getting everything to, to support your body. Are there specific micronutrients that are really important as an athlete, like high performance athlete versus the uh, recreational athlete? For example, I know high performance athlete may need more iron. Is it true? Yeah. So the more you're training, essentially, the more iron you're using. And so you want to make sure that you're replacing that iron to be able to keep up with the demands that you're placing on the body. So, you know, everyone's body needs the, you know, micronutrients, but it's a matter of how much you're training in terms of how much you're going to need. And so if, for example, let's take, you know, iron, because you brought that up, if you are running, let's say 100 miles a week, you're going to need more iron than if you're running 10 miles a week. So gotcha. you want to make sure that, you know, you're kind of basing your nutrition off of your training and same thing with your recovery to make sure that they're matched and you're not having, you know, an overexertion from your training um, or that you're eating maybe more than you need to in terms of like supplements. Well, how about iodine? I know uh, many athletes, high performance ath athletes, actually, they were diagnosed with high poor thyroidism. Uh, there's a uh, I think a few American uh, Olympic athletes, they were diagnosed with hypothyroidism. One of uh, them is, uh, I think, a former Olympian uh, track and field athlete. Uh, is it Jackie? I'm not sure. I would have to double check um, <laughs> to see which ones were had, had hypothyroidism. But it's, it is fairly common among athletes. Oh, very common among athletes. Like, it, that's very interesting to know. Uh, I would like to share my stories because when I was an athlete, and I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism. At that time, I was diagnosed in Canada. Uh, when I was Malaysia, when I was in Malaysia, uh, nobody knows, and we were not told to do any blood tests. Like blood tests for athletes is, is very rare, and unless the the athletes are sick, you know. Uh, certain diseases otherwise 
I don't remember we were asked to do any blood test to see our performance or to improve our performance. So when I came to Canada, I realized I always felt cold. I gained weight easily, even though I don't eat much. I don't eat much. I gain weight easily. And that symptom or sign already happened when I was in Malaysia. But no one knows. I didn't know. I knew that I was I, I get I got tired easily and I push a lot and I got tired easily. I always have to use my my mental training. <laughs> I did my graduate studies in sports psychology and sports psychology uh, is my favorite subject. So I use a lot of mental training to overcome my uh, physical weaknesses, right? Mm -hmm. And when I was in Canada and Canada has a winter season and I always feel cold even though it's not really winter time. And I went to see family doctor and doctor asked me to do blood tests. And from the blood test, I was told that I have hypothyroidism and I was so shocked. And I asked my doctor, I said, what happened? Why? How come? What course is that? And the doctor at that time, that was in 1994, I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism. And doc the doctor didn't know at that time because I don't blame them. Uh, at that time, there wasn't any research about overtraining. I only found out more training and like more research founding about this, you know, this overtraining that causes the hypothyroidism back in year 2000. Research started in about year 2000 in, uh, in terms of hypothyroidism relates to overtraining or maybe over dieting. I don't know. Yeah. At that time, in, back in 1994, the doctor said he doesn't know, you know, uh, it happened to people. So, and he asked me to take medication for life. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's why. And then he said, why? Because your body uh, lack of uh, iodine. Well, what is iodine so important? <laughs> no, I knew that, but I wasn't realized that I, I would get the hypothyroidism, right? So what do you think about that? Like what causes hypothyroidism? Uh, it, it, do you agree that it, it is because of overtraining? So, you know, we can't specifically diagnose overtraining from a blood test specifically. We can see signs of overtraining and we can make suggestions, but, you know, we're not a medical company, so we don't make any medical diagnoses. And if there is something that seems like it could be problematic, we always recommend people follow up with their primary care provider to make sure that they have all of their medical needs met. Um, but we do see some signs of hypothyroidism in some athletes. And... It, it can be tricky because sometimes we'll see low low thyroid, um, we'll see an elevated TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. And basically TSH is trying to stimulate your thyroid or you know your metabolism essentially. And so it is, you know, when you're under eating or overtraining and your body is not getting enough fuel, then yeah. you know, you're not getting that same metabolic output. So the you know, your TSH starts to go up because it's like, I'm gonna try to get this going but your body just doesn't have what it needs. Um, and so we start to see high TSH and low metabolism because your body is just trying to do its best to keep you alive. And so, you know, by under fueling, we can start to see some, you know, decreases in metabolism with um, metabolic rate and then signs and symptoms too. Like you mentioned feeling cold all the time, um, you know, feeling tired, feeling weak, um, maybe more irritable, um, hair, skin, and nails kind of start to deteriorate in terms of like the quality. So there are a lot of signs that we can look for that can sort of indicate that someone might be overtraining in terms of what they're asking their body to do relative to what they're giving it in terms of their nutrition and recovery. I was so sure when I was told that I have hypothyroidism, I started to read more about it. And I asked my family if we have this hereditary <laughs> gene or, mm -hmm. or diseases, right? And my family said, no, no one has that kind of diseases or sign or symptom. Only myself have that. That's how I started to read more about overtraining, uh, under eating, which I did. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, in Taekwondo, as I was a Taekwondo athlete, they is a weight category. We were asked to maintain our weight in order to compete in a certain weight category. So imagine if you are young and you're still growing, 
even if you're a teenager, you're still growing. And but if you started with a certain category and you won competition in that category, you were asked to maintain the weight, even though your body is still growing. So in order to maintain the weight, you have to like train a lot and you cannot eat too much. I think it's similar to gymnastic maybe or other sports. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how we push ourselves beyond our physical body that can take. And I actually, I was under eating, yes. I had tried to lose weight. Can you imagine 10 kilogram in two weeks? That's so <laughs> well, I know I pushed myself. So I, I knew I, I, I knew I myself is mentally strong. I, I, I can, I know that I'm really, really strong mentally. That's how I said, that's why I said earlier, I just felt that my body just cannot follow my, my mind. Like sometimes your mind can go really fast. Your mind is really strong. You think that you can do it, but just your body just cannot follow. Mm -hmm. That's how I felt. So yeah, I under I was under eating and overtraining for sure. I train. I'm not so sure about over overtraining, but I train. But I the nutrition they don't come along side by side. You know, you you train maybe you train mm -hmm. three times a day, but you only eat once a day. For example, even though the training three times a day may not be overtraining for some for some coaches or. And but because of your under eating, then it can you know it affects the hormone. Then yeah. I realized I should eat more iodine, and I found out that all oh, iodine is from the sea. And I live close to the sea. <laughs> I eat seafood all the time, but I still got iodine deficiency. Uh yeah. So what do you think about eating natural food? Natural food can help that, or as an athlete, how 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 can you avoid that hypothyroidism? Yeah, so making sure that you're getting enough energy is the most important thing. And you do want to consider quality nutritional sources. So we always recommend that people get as much of their nutrients as possible from real food instead of relying solely on supplements. Um, but there are times in which you might be really low in something where a supplement is necessary to help give you kind of a boost and get you up to a safer level. And then usually, you know, I'll recommend that people take a supplement for a while. And then once they get close to that sort of ideal line, then we'll take the supplement away and kind of let them cross the finish line into that ideal range for a nutrient um, using real foods, because it's really difficult to create a toxicity from food sources. Um, our bodies are really good at about absorbing kind of how much they need from foods. And usually foods don't have a really high amount of any single nutrient in them that could be potentially harmful. But it's a lot easier to overdo a nutrient in terms of your intake with supplements. And so by using a combination of real food and supplements where they're necessary, you can really create um, a nice sort of ideal range of nutrients for you to get you into that kind of happy place where your body is doing its best. But, you know, in terms of like your situation, yeah, it definitely sounds like you weren't getting enough fuel for your training. I recommend that my athletes that I work with in my private practice eat at least four meals a day because when you're training, you have higher nutritional needs. And so it's not really feasible to get all of the nutrients you need just in three meals. Um, and so adding a fourth meal or multiple snacks throughout the day can be a really nice strategy to help you meet those needs um, that you've kind of increased because of your training. So how about iodine from the kelp? Does it mm -hmm. help? Yeah, I think that, you know, kelp and seaweed is a really good source of iodine. Um, you can also use iodized salt. So just like regular table salt has iodine added to it. Um, if you're using like sea salt that doesn't have any iodine added to it, so it's not going to be quite as good of a source. So you could certainly use, you know, kelp, seaweed, other things like that to help bring that level up. But you might, depending on your level, you might need a supplement or using iodized salts. I just thought, yes, I was asked to take that as well. Interesting, like in Malaysia, we call it iodine. Mm. Yeah, in English, we say it iodine. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, I say iodine and you say iodine. It's the same thing. And I checked the online information, Olympic sprinter, Gail Devers. Mm, yeah. Uh, 
she, uh, yeah, she talked about her hypothyroidism. Yeah, and it's kind of nice, I think, as an athlete to see other athletes who might be going through or have gone something similar to you. You know, it's kind of comforting to know that you're not alone and that there are other people who have gone through this. So I think it's great when other athletes can connect with, or if, if they can't contact them, but just to know that they're out there and to kind of feel like they're, you know, part of a community instead of going through something, you know, in isolation. Yeah, it's good to know now. But at that time, when I was told about the hypothyroidism, I knew nobody who had this kind of uh, symptom or sign. I don't know if I should call it disease, but now they call it thyroid disease. Yeah, it, you felt so lonely and you felt so helpless and you just go with the advice from the doctor. So if you know someone is out there, especially the high-performance athlete, have the similar thyroid issues then you don't feel that lonely especially when you read this article about gail devil uh gail devers she's a three-time olympic gold medalist in track and field she's a national spokesperson for glenn central a nationwide public health education campaign for the american medical women's association yeah she's considered one of the best sprinters in the u.s history so i i read and then i thought about it i'm sure she trains really hard yeah I, i'm sure she may not know much about this nutritional science or exercise physiology otherwise perhaps she could perform better i don't know I, that's my assumption that's my my uh, opinion about it what do you think about it yeah, and it's really fun to work with athletes because, you know, sometimes athletes come to us and they don't have any signs or symptoms and they're like, I think I feel pretty good. And we see that there are some things that are, you know, maybe outside that ideal range and we can modify those to get them into that ideal range. And then they're like, oh, wow, like I'm performing and I'm feeling so much better. And I didn't even think that I was feeling bad before. So, you know, there's a, usually a lot of things that we can work on. Um, you know, I've been doing this for years and I've never seen anyone with a perfect blood test. There's always at least something um, that might be out of range. Some are, you know, have more things to work on than others, but usually that there's something that you might be missing or, you know, low or high. And, and so, you know, I like to tell my athletes, there's always a next level. Um, and so we want to make sure that everyone's kind of feeling their best with what they're doing. That's really, really fascinating to hear that you were saying you always see something and that you don't see many perfect blood sample within the high performance athlete so can i say that you actually we actually may see more normal blood sample in recreational athlete or a regular population than the high performance athlete can i say that like the high performance athlete somehow their blood sample are not consistently similar or normal uh, relatively or comparing with the general population? So one thing to keep in mind is at athlete blood test, we have, you have the standard range. So like if you go to your doctor, they're gonna have like a standard range, but then we also have the athlete ideal range. And this is based on off of over a decade of research that's been collected on athletes to kind of identify what's ideal for an athlete. So if you go to the doctor, they're going to compare you to the general population who is sedentary. And so your doctor might say, oh, you know, you know, Sarah, you have just your iron level is fine. You know, there's, it's within the normal range. You're good to go. And that might be true if you're just kind of sitting at a desk all day and not being physically active. But for someone who's training and someone who's an athlete, that kind of normal iron might not be ideal for what they're training in terms of their load and their volume. So that's why we have kind of the standard range that you'll see on the blood panel, but then also the athlete ideal range. And so it's really that athlete ideal range that you wanna be in to make sure that you are getting what you need for your training. And this is gonna change depending on, you know, your age, you know, are you male, are you female? What sport are you doing? How many hours a week are you training? Those types of things are gonna determine kind of what that ideal might be. So it's really important to take that into consideration. So I don't necessarily think that the elite athletes are, you know, not as uh, good about their blood work, but it's just that they have much higher demands and so it's a little bit harder for them to meet all of those needs. But we do see that it's possible to get you know, get people into that ideal range for those key 
biomarkers um, with a few blood tests to make sure that they have kind of an idea of what they need to be working on. So for example, if you're low in folate, um, you, know, you wouldn't necessarily know that, but after a blood test, you might say, okay, I'm gonna start taking a folic acid supplement and eating more leafy green vegetables. So you can kind of start to change things to sort of optimize your performance and how you're feeling. That is really, really um, good info to know. So can I say that the for athlete, they, uh, their range are different than the regular general or general population? Just because they are athlete, uh, we may expect them to have a higher level iron, higher level iodine, and et cetera, like so on. Like if, yeah. if, if they're standard, they have a different level of standard. If they want to meet, like because of their high level of training and high level performance, they need to have a higher, a little bit higher range of percentage than the regular people, regular gym. Yeah. Some, so some biomarkers, there is a difference. Some are the same. So there's no difference between the general population and athletes. But for a lot of the biomarkers, there is a difference. And so if you get a blood test, you can see directly on the report, sort of like the standard range, and then also the athlete ideal range. So you can kind of see the difference and how like, oh, yeah, that's a little bit higher for athletes, they need a little bit more of that. Or this one's lower, they might need less than the average population. So it's really kind of fun to see and compare them between athlete ideal and sort of the general population. Good, 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 good. Uh, that's, uh, well, hopefully out, athletes out there or coaches out there, uh, if you're listening, uh, you may want to pay more attention to this. <laughs> it will be really, really beneficial to your team. So for me, I have another question. I know some athletes, because of their high-performance training, and they tend to have a high tolerance of pain, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if anything happened to their body, they may not know. Just like what you mentioned, they trained so hard, and they didn't know that they have issue with their thyroid until uh, at the later stage. Uh, I do experience that. I have a very high tolerance of pain. I didn't feel any uh, headline fracture or, or any injury until I... I see it myself and, and blood came out and then I felt like, oh, I have blood. And then I realized, oh, yeah, I've, I hurt myself <laughs> because of my tolerance of pain. Um, I, I said that because I did many tests, uh, testing. Uh, people said that I have a very high tolerance of pain. I experienced myself. I fractured my uh, fibula bone. It was hairline fracture. I didn't, wow. I didn't feel it until I saw blood came out and it's covered up. It's like internal bleeding uh, in my leg. And I saw blood all over inside my leg. And I went for uh, x-ray and the doctor said I had headline fracture. I didn't feel much about it, actually. Yeah, that's how it is. You know, I, I, I'm i sure many athletes, they actually experience, experience the same thing because they train so hard and they tend to have high tolerance of pain, even though they didn't know they may be injured inside or maybe they already developed certain diseases. What do you think about mm -hmm. it? Yeah, yeah. And so you bring up a really good point that you might not necessarily notice that something is off because they're trained in a lot of ways to kind of push past that discomfort or that pain. But you want to be mindful too, as an athlete that, you know, pain and you know, discomfort is, you know, you're especially pain, um, your body's trying to tell you something. And so if you're chronically fatigued, if you're always feeling like you're not at the strength where you were before, um, if you feel like something is off, chances are that it is. Um, and so you do want to make sure that you get things checked out to make sure that you have what you need um, because it is something that you want to be mindful of. You only have one body and so you want to take care of it. And so if you do feel like there's something off that chances are that there is. And a lot of times we see biomarkers that are out of range and people don't even have symptoms yet. So if you're starting to feel symptomatic, that can mean that things are a little bit farther out of that ideal range um, because that's kind of your body's last ditch effort to say like, hey, pay attention, like you need to change something. Yeah, that's why it is so important to go for blood tests because from blood tests you may see uh, more detailed information, uh, more than how you feel about your body. Sometimes because you have high tolerance of pain, uh, just because you, uh, well, you have high tolerance of pain due to the long hours of training and competition that train you to, you already train to, you know, take the pain. Uh, you have to feel the discomfort in your body. You are so 
so used to that kind of discomfort to your body and you may ignore certain signs and symptoms. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's why it is important to go for blood tests to see more detail, right? So exactly. I, I, do, I do encourage athletes and coaches to pay more attention to that. Uh, I, I, do, I do encourage that and I do believe we will train and as athlete, as an athlete or as a high performance athlete, we will train to, uh, to endure pain. Because you have to endure pain. The training is really painful, especially you are at the high performance. You have to push yourself even though you're really, really tired. Uh, you know that by pushing yourself, you actually improve your mental strength. And sometimes training uh, physiologically is very, very tiring. But we also uh, learned that uh, in terms of uh, principle of training in order to improve you have to overload yourself, uh, overloading in terms of physical training, like uh, weight training, right? In terms of weight training, you have to push um, up to a level that you cannot push anymore. I mean, that is the kind of principle of training, overloading. Yeah. So, yeah, that kind of principle, you already train to endure pain, to endure discomfort, and you may not know what is actually happening inside your body. So I think it's really, really important to go for blood tests. Yeah, so... Yeah. So from your experience, who should we go for, go to for blood tests? Uh, should we go to our family doctor? Do you know, do you think they will understand? Uh, should we go to a specialist or should we go for, I don't know, consultant or agency, uh, sports medicine or sports center or something like that? Yeah. What is yeah, that? yeah. So it's a good question. And so this is part of why um, our founder, Dr. Rock, started athletebloodtest.com is because there, he didn't feel like there was really a good place for athletes to have their blood work interpreted from an athletic standpoint. So if you go to your doctor, you know, they're not trained to look at your blood work from a performance standpoint. They're mm -hmm. looking for disease and deficiency. They want to make sure that you're a healthy person, not necessarily how you're performing in your sport. And so that's why I recommend that my athletes go through athletebloodtest.com is because it's based on over 10 years of research looking purely at athlete, um, athletic performance and athlete health based on, you know, all of this data that they've collected. And so, you know, by going to just kind of your average physician, you know, they're doing their job, but you're asking them to do something that's kind of outside of their, their job in terms of a performance interpretation of the blood. And so, you know, by going through athletebloodtest.com, you get that and vice versa. Like, you know, we wouldn't recommend people go to athletebloodtest.com if they're feeling sick and they want to know, is there something wrong, right? Like we're not a medical provider. So you want to make sure that you're using sort of each resource appropriately. You know, and if you, you know, don't have access to athletebloodtest.com, if they're overseas, if they're in another country, um, then I would recommend going with like a sports medicine doctor who's going to have more of that athletic eye than just sort of a general care physician um, or someone that's not trained um, in sports medicine. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really good advice. I sometimes I went to my family doctor and asked, uh, should I do this test? And then my family doctor would ask why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And one, two, five, if I, my liver is okay <laughs> if i if i a uh, doctor should i do testing for my gallbladder should i do testing for my heart should i do testing for my lung that's how detailed i ask you know should i do this should i do that and sometimes i think the family doctor think that i, I think too much and overwhelm <laughs> myself yeah that, that's a good good advice you should go for a special special center right sports medicine or uh, sports center like uh, you mentioned the uh, athlete blood test center that's a very, very good uh, information to have. So my other question is, uh, the reason why we need to blood, do blood tests is similar to the reason why we need to do x-ray. Like for x-ray, for me, if it's not because of x-ray, I didn't know that I had headline fracture because I don't feel it. I didn't feel the pain. I only mm -hmm. see internal bleeding. I only see internal bleeding appear in my, like underneath my, my skin or leg. And I only found out that I had headline fracture through x-ray. So I'm sure uh, similar to blood tests, you don't know what is your issues or what is uh, what kind of deficiency that you may have. Maybe iodine, iodine or maybe uh, iron or maybe vitamin D. 
uh, yeah, you will not know until you do a blood test or the blood test. Exactly. Yeah. 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 If you're listening out there, uh, remember blood test is similar to, I would say for my opinion, I think blood test is similar to x-ray. Uh, without x-ray, I would not know that I had headline fracture. So similarly, if you don't do blood test, you may not know what kind of uh, micronutrients that you need more of. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Roby, I uh, would like to know, uh, do you recommend athletes to take uh, extra or nutritional supplement? If yes, do you have any specific uh, method or specific product that a certain sports athlete should take more of of one thing than the other athlete? For example, like long distance runner, should they take more protein powder than the uh, taekwondo athlete, for example? Yeah, that's a great question. So in terms of like micronutrients, so vitamins and minerals, I don't recommend that athletes take any supplements until they've had blood work done because blind supplementation can be really dangerous. You can really throw off some of your biochemistry by taking too much of one supplement um, and getting too much of a certain nutrient. So, you know, we only recommend supplements if we see there's a need based on the blood work. But in terms of like, you know, performance supplements outside of you know, nutrition, um, you know, I generally recommend that most athletes take a creatine monohydrate, whether they're weightlifting or if they're running, there's been a lot of research done on creatine and shown some really nice benefits in terms of bone health, muscle health, um, even brain health has been shown to be improved with um, creatine. So that's kind of a ubiquitous one that I recommend. Another one is collagen. Um, that can really help with connective tissue um, and to make sure that those tendons and ligaments have the best integrity that they can. So those are two that I think a lot of athletes would benefit from. Um, and outside of that, it kind of depends on the sport. Um, usually if they're doing like a power sport, so like powerlifting, weightlifting, something like that, they might need a higher protein intake than someone who is doing less of a power sport that's not going to need so much of that muscle building or muscle strength. So, you know, a dancer might not need as much protein as say like a football player who's lifting weights. So it's hard to say that certain sports would need, you know, specific supplements. It really just depends on the person and sort of where their body's at and what their, their training needs are. Yeah. Good to know. So if you don't do a lot of power training, you may not take as much protein powder than those who carry weights, for example, right? Uh, so how about creatine? You mentioned about it. I uh, would like to know more about it. Is that C-R-A-T-I-N? How to spell that uh, nutrient? Yeah, I think it's uh, C-R-E-A-T-I-N-E. -E. Um, yeah, so creatine, creatine monohydrate, you'll see it sometimes. And it's nice because there really aren't side effects from it, um, but there are a lot of benefits based on the research that we've seen. And so, you know, it's just like a tasteless, you know, odorless powder. You can get flavored ones, I think, but I just take a plain one and I'll add it in smoothies. Um, my parents put it in their coffee in the morning. So even if they're not athletes, I still usually recommend people take it um, because there are some other benefits from it. And it's really inexpensive too. A lot of supplements can be pretty expensive, um, but creatine is really cheap. It's very easy to get. You can just buy it online um, and it's really safe to take. So just one teaspoon a day is kind of enough to get those, those benefits in. Good to know. So I think uh, as a taekwondo athlete, I wish I know all this and I should have taken power, protein powder, <laughs> uh, creatine, and uh, what's the other one besides creatine? Uh, and you, collagen. You know? Uh, collagen, yeah. I know uh, the importance of collagen. Uh, for many communities, they like to cook, um, what do you call that, pork mm -hmm. or beef soup, you know, like the bone. Yeah. Animal soup, they said that animal bone soup have, have a lot of collagen. And my family used to cook that. And But then nowadays, people think that that is too fatty, you know, a lot of fat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, I was, we were told that, oh, it's good. Fat is good for you. Yeah. So, about cooking bone soup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, bone yeah. broth is popular now too. Uh, <laughs> but it's kind of fattening, right? There can be a lot of calories in it, depending on what you put in there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So do you think uh, we should take bone soup 
than the collagen supplement or should we take collagen supplement more than a bonzo? I mean, I would just take collagen every day. I put it in my, you know, smoothies or if I have one, um, you know, but there can be a lot of other nutrients in the, you know, bone broth or the bone soup too. So I would say probably mixing it up would be beneficial because you're going to get more nutrients from the, the bone broth than you will just from the collagen supplement. But sometimes you might not feel like eating that every day. And so just taking a supplement can be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, that's good to know. I'm going to start looking for collagen. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any advice for uh, Taekwondo athletes? Like Taekwondo athletes, they, they do weight training. They mm -hmm. do a lot of explosive training, plyometric training, jumping up and down because uh, the kick, they have to be explosive. Uh, mm -hmm. When you do kick, you have to be like, boom, you know, like, boom, you know, certain kick. It has to be explosive because you need speed. Mm -hmm. I don't know what can see your kick if people can see your kick you will not be able to score if i can see your kick, i can run away before you kick me right right so that be really fast and boom explosive in, in order to have a spa, fast movement it has to be explosive it's like sprinting right otherwise mm -hmm. kick high and people can see there's no speed and there's no explosive power so what do you think should they take protein powder you know i would recommend getting as much protein from real food sources as possible because when you eat you know, meat or eggs or dairy or fish or, you know, even plant sources of protein, you know, beans, nuts, that sort of thing, soybeans, they're going to come with a lot of other nutrients too. Whereas mm. with a protein powder, you're not really getting a whole lot of other nutrients. So mm. it can kind of, you know, decrease your intake of certain nutrients. So better off to get as much as possible from real food. And then if you need, you know, a protein shake on top of that to sort of supplement, then then I think that's fine. I don't think that protein powder is a bad thing, but just trying to get as much as you can from real food is, is helpful. Um, I would make sure that they're eating enough carbohydrates because like you said, it's very explosive. And yeah. with some of these high intense exercises, they're going to need carbohydrate for their fuel. And so having a low carb diet can kind of hold them back from a performance standpoint. So making sure that they're getting enough starchy foods um, with all of their meals and then eating, you know, several times a day throughout the day to make sure that they're getting nutrients on a consistent basis and they're not going too long of a period without eating um, is really important for them. Good to know. Uh, I know at Taekwondo Athlete also they want or they are always uh, uh, asked to maintain their weight. Uh, mm -hmm. Athlete, they on diet all the time. Uh, do you have any advice for them? I uh, how to lose weight healthily. I know uh, I was not taught the healthy way. <laughs> I starve myself, and for me, I starve myself. I don't eat, and I don't drink, especially before the weight in. I de dehydrate myself. Uh, I I don't think that was good advice. No one advised me. We we were told that okay, I have to lose weight. What should I do? What should I look? Uh, what how can I uh, uh, lose my extra weight or pound and the old method is like don't eat uh, <laughs> when you don't eat then you can lose weight yeah so what is your advice for the athlete that have the weight category it can be really tough managing a weight category um you know i would say definitely you want to work with your coach and you know don't necessarily be afraid to go up a weight class because yeah. if that means that you're able to eat more and be better fueled and be stronger, then I think your chances of winning at a higher weight class are better than if you're really malnourished and, you know, fatigued and worn out and tired at a depleted state, but you're still able to make a lower weight class. So I think there's kind of this misconception that like you always want to compete at the lowest weight class possible. And I yeah. understand the thought. But the bigger. <laughs> You know, you're the tallest, you're the bigger, you know, biggest in your weight. Yeah, exactly. So I, I see where that's coming from. But yeah. you don't want to underestimate the power of proper fueling and because your fuel is going to give you your strength. So yeah. trying to eat as much kind of nourishing food as possible um, to try to get those nutrients in so you can really you know, feel your best and do your best in your competitions without being, you know, low in certain nutrients and energy overall, I think it's so important for them. Exactly. I'm glad, I'm so glad that you mentioned that it is so important to have strong muscle and feel more comfortable with your body, with your weight category. That's why I actually went to heavyweight. Uh, before, when I first started as an athlete, I started with the lighter weight. I uh, was called featherweight. You know, in mm -hmm. at that time, Taekwondo have eight weight category from uh, fin, 
fly. I'm I'm going from the the lightest to the heaviest. So okay. fly, bantam, feather, light, welter, middle, heavy. So I eight weight category at that time in my time there are weight eight weight categories in the female techno competition. At that time it's only the sparring. It's mm-hmm. a full tag. Uh, so imagine like from fin fly bantam. I was in feather the fourth. The fourth lightest, you know, I was in feather. I started in mm-hmm. feather. I was like, I said, started in bantam, and then I, as a kid, I I grew right. So bantam feather, I started feather, and I represented the country in feather weight, and I was still growing. And then I jumped to lightweight because I was growing. I I wasn't able. It's very hard for me to maintain my feather weight. So I went to lightweight. Mm-hmm. I won championship, but then from lightweight. I trained so hard because at that time I trained so hard to maintain my featherweight. I could not. Then I went to lightweight. At that time, at that time, I think I I already uh, sort of damaged my body system. Mm-hmm. So it was really hard for me to maintain my weight in lightweight. Then right from lightweight, I already jumped from he- uh, featherweight, the uh, bent of feather lightweight. Now I went. I had to go to welterweight, but I felt that even in welterweight, I actually uh, easily gain weight. I I. I suspected that at that time my hypothyroidism started to kick in, but I didn't know that. Uh, I gained weight easily. I felt tired easily, and I gained weight easily without eating much. But that's how I decided. I say, no more. I told myself I don't want to go through that painful experience anymore. I didn't want to starve myself. I didn't want to force myself not to drink water. I didn't want to. Uh, Go on hard diet for not eating my favorite food. You know, I like to eat mm-hmm. a lot. <laughs> so I feel so I feel hungry all the time. And at that time, I told myself, "That's it, no more." Mm-hmm. I want to go to heaviest weight, the heaviest one. You know, can you imagine? Like I, I jump from I keep I from lightweight. I jump welterweight. I jump middleweight. I went all the way to heavyweight, and no one at that time. Only two people believed that I could do it, but most of the people. Do not believe, did not believe that I I could make it to heavyweight and won the championships because I don't blame them because no one had been there. I you know no no one has ever wanted to go to heavyweight, especially if you are female. If you say I'm female, I mean heavyweight. People think that you're big size and you're fat, you're big and you're clumsy. <laughs> That's how it is, and people think heavyweight. What heavyweight? You're big and you know clumsy. Uh, I I didn't I didn't think much about it. I I told myself that's it. I want to. I wanted to enjoy my food. I love to eat, and I also yeah. love to, you know. And I, I feel so good. Oh, heavy man! I, I look at all my athletes and my call, you know, my co, co team, team, team members. They were working hard. They were on diet. I, I, I For me, they always look at me enjoying my food. <laughs> I, then, even though I look bigger than before, and some of the coaches say, "Sarah, you gain weight. You look fat now." You know. That kind of word it doesn't really help the athlete, but I really I didn't care less. I in my brain I was like I don't care about this labeling, but I just wanted to win the gold in heavyweight. I was so focused. Uh, that's how I managed to win gold medal at the Asian Championship. I was the first Malaysian to actually best the the world champion, the Korean uh, athlete, uh, also world champion. So that's my story, and I feel so good. I feel so strong, even though I was one. I was always the shortest. Actually, mm-hmm. it was always the shortest. I in my heavyweight. Imagine heavyweight people tends to be tall, you know, tall and big, and otherwise, maybe uh, tall and big. Sometimes people call it fat, and 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 generally they are a bit slower than the fin weight. The fin weight they are lightest, right? They are fast. You know, when they kick, they're mm-hmm. really fast, of course, because they are shorter and they are lightest. And the heavyweight, they their speed is not as fast. You know, people tend to have that kind of mentality. So I just want to share my experience that when I change my mentality and change my weight category to light to from lightweight to heavyweight, I jump like two, three weight above. I feel so good. I, I feel love so that. I feel so good. I feel so happy. I can eat all kinds of food. No one could tell me that you cannot eat this. You cannot eat that. And when I I do my training, I feel so strong. You know, I feel like oh, I feel so strong. That's why I. I I I could won the competition even though I was the shortest. If you check my profile online, <laughs> the picture at that time they didn't take much video. I wish I could have that video clip, uh, but I do have the picture. But from the picture, you will see that I'm actually the shortest. Uh, but I won. Yeah, that I, is such I, a great story. 
<laughs> Good for you. Congratulations. I think that that is a perfect example that, you know, just because you were shorter, you were well fueled, but you know, you had the strength to go out and win. And it's not just about being as light as you possibly can. Yeah. Yeah. I, I use, I, when I decided to go to heavyweight, I do a lot. I did a lot of weight training. I knew that like to strengthen on my body because weight, heavyweight people are, are bigger, have uh, like taller and the bigger size, they, they are stronger. So I told myself I need to have a stronger body so that I can take on the, the pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I a lot of weight training and I, I ate all kinds of food and I, I feel so happy. Good. <laughs> Yay. I know. I, I'm glad you mentioned that. You say, you know, uh, you don't, we don't have to maintain the weight. If you feel comfortable, you can go to the next weight category, even though you may not be the tallest in your weight category, but that's okay. Because competition okay. is not the tallest can win. It's the smartest win. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, like yeah, I just I'm just curious from your competition. Uh, since Olympics is coming, uh, do you get more athletes going for testing at this period at this season? We do have a lot more athletes testing now, and we have several athletes that work with us at athletebloodtest.com who are qualified for the Olympic trials, which is really exciting. So it's important that we, you know, make sure that we're helping them as much as we can. And so it, it definitely gets a little bit busier now, kind of in the summertime when, you know, people are running marathons and doing triathlons and more kind of endurance sports now that are outdoors during the summer times. Wow. Wow. So if an athlete find out that there's issue with their blood sample, um, do you think they have the time to catch up? How soon they can catch up with the blood sample so that they they meet the uh, the healthy or the not only the healthy range but also the high performance range? Yeah, so uh, we usually recommend they get tested six weeks before their kind of a race or their big competition. So if anyone is you know going to the Olympics, then you would want to make sure that they're testing six weeks beforehand. So that gives us enough time to change anything with their nutrition, with their supplements, maybe recovery, training, that sort of thing to get them into the ideal range. Can they catch up within six weeks after the uh, blood sample test? Yeah, six weeks should be enough time to make those changes to get them kind of where they want to be or where they need to be. Oh, uh, six weeks. So six weeks before the competition, they should check. Uh, that's a good information. So if you're athlete or coaches out there, listen to this uh, important statement. <laughs> six weeks before. I think that's minimum, right? Minimum six weeks before you should go for a test. And uh, if you are... If you find out you have deficiency in certain nutrients or micronutrients, you, I think you still have time to catch up, correct? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So can they go earlier than six weeks? Yeah. I mean, you can go at really at any point. Um, and it, it would probably be best if they get a baseline test before that six weeks and then six weeks before the competition, they can kind of do a little check-in to see where they're at for some of those key micronutrients and other biomarkers to sort of modify those. And so that gives you a little bit more time to make changes if you're seriously outside that ideal range for some biomarkers. So what is the difference between biomarkers and micronutrients and what are they? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Um, Nutrients essentially are biomarkers. So biomarker is something in your body that's going to sort of be a proxy or look at something that could change within the body. Um, and so we look at different hormones, micronutrients. Um, these are all going to be what we would call a biomarker. And so this is basically something that can stand for a, a point in health and that could change based on how your body is um, active or inactive. So uh, as a coaches, not as a coach, uh, as for coaches, what is your advice to them? How do how can they take care of their athletes? I would make sure that they're, you know, eating enough. I think is one of the big things. Depending on the sport, it can be really difficult to eat enough to keep up with their strength and their energy needs. Um, you know, so encouraging them to eat kind of a few hours before their practice, and then 
eating right after their practice is also really important. Making sure that they're getting at least one day off a week to help bring some of that cortisol or some of that stress hormone down, that's really important. And then keeping an eye on them to make sure that you don't notice any big changes in terms of their energy or their performance. Um, I was recently working with a soccer coach who noticed one of his players was suddenly not quite performing and as well as she was before. And so I started working with her and we figured out that there were some issues with her nutrition. And since then, we've kind of gotten her back up to speed in terms of what she is capable of doing. So I think just being cognizant and vigilant with your athletes and making sure that you have a, a pulse on kind of how they're performing. And if you see any anyone start to suffer or kind of decline, make sure that you talk to them um, and get them the help that they need. Wow. Then how about what is your advice for athletes? The high performance athlete or, or the regular athlete as well? Yeah. Um, and I would say similarly, you know, making sure that they're eating enough, getting enough, you know, real nutrient dense foods because they do have higher nutrient needs. Um, and I mentioned earlier, having at least four meals a day is really important. I don't think that athletes can get all of the nutrients that they need to support their body and training by just having three meals a day. So including several snacks or another meal throughout the day is really important make sure that they're getting enough and also being in tune with your body. So if you start to feel really tired all the time, if you're suddenly you're not quite as strong as you were, or you're noticing some changes, make sure that you, you know, follow up, get some blood work done. Um, you know, talk to your coach, talk to a sports medicine doctor to make sure that there's nothing going on because your body doesn't just change without a reason. There's something going on and you want to make sure that you understand what, what is going on. And also making sure that you're just getting enough sleep. So taking at least one recovery day and then getting, I would say, at least eight hours of sleep every night um, and, you know, taking, taking care of your body, trying to manage some stress is really important. Wow. And so for blood tests, if the athlete asks, is there any specific blood test that they should or highly recommend to do, to take? <clears throat> I know <clears throat> there are many, uh, there are a list of uh, blood tests. So mm -hmm. what is the important element? Uh, what, what is the most important blood test that you think every athlete should take? Um, like I said, I would recommend starting with the gold panel because that is going to give you the biggest kind of comprehensive look at your blood and it'll give you a lot of good information. Uh, for athletes who do you serve all the countries in the world or uh, how about uh, athletes that are not, uh, that may not have access uh, to the, uh, to the services? How should they uh, obtain the blood test? Should they go to the family doctor? Do you think the family doctor will listen to them? Um, you know, you can try. I don't think that the family doctors are trained to analyze the blood from a performance standpoint, but it's mm -hmm. going to be better than nothing at all. And so, you know, maybe they are anemic, for example, and their iron is really low, that would still come up on the blood test. So I would still say if you don't have access to a sports medicine doctor or like a training facility or something else, and, you know, your choice is either nothing or going to your primary care physician, I would go with that because they'll at least be able to check things to make sure that overall you have sound health. Um, and that's a good starting point for any athlete. Wow. Um, so if if they go to the family doctor in the, in their own countries and uh, what kind of let's say they do not have access to website or they they have access to website and they may not understand the gold panel. So mm -hmm. what should they tell their family doctor uh, what kind of sample should they take? For example, for me, when I ask my family doctor uh, for a specific blood test, I would say, uh, family doctor, should I? have my sample test for uh, sugar level? Should I have my blood test for to test my liver, to test my, my kidney, for example? Like what should they tell the mm. family doctor what kind of blood test they should take? Yeah, so I would try to get what's called a CBC or complete blood count. Um, CBC. And look, okay. Yep, so get a CBC. So taking a look at all of your red blood cell um, indicators. So looking at the size, the shape, the number, those types of things with um, your red blood cells. Also looking at iron is really important. Um, I would also look at cortisol 
um, if you can. And then the vitamins I would recommend are folate, B12, and vitamin D. Oh, Those would all be really important. Okay, what is folate? So folate is B9. Um, okay. It's a type of B vitamin, and it's really important for red blood cell production mm -hmm. and healthy size cells. Sounds like uh, vitamin B complex. How about vitamin B complex? Should, should the athlete take a uh, vitamin B complex that will include all the folate, B12, and all that? Yeah, so I would recommend getting their B12 level checked because even though B12 is a B vitamin, um, it can actually accumulate in the liver. And so you do see oh. some athletes who have high levels of vitamin B12. And so you want to make sure that you're not adding and getting to kind of an unhealthy high level of B12. But it, as, assuming that they don't, then yeah, you could definitely take a B, you know, a B complex to make sure you're getting all the B vitamins. Wow, so if you're listening out there, make sure you check uh, the link down below uh, inside the description. Uh, check for the gold panel. Uh, do leave us a comment if you have any questions. We are here to help you and we are here, especially me, I will personally reply your message. And before I go further or before I end this uh, interview or uh, fun time chat, I have another question for collagen, for collagen. Uh, if you see combat sports, uh, mixed martial arts, uh, karate, taekwondo, and all the jujitsu, they like they really uh, contact, like physical contact, like really, mm -hmm. you know, kick your body or kick your head or kick your hand or kick your uh, your the target and kick your leg. Uh, it's actually full contact. Uh, do you think they should take more collagen? Because as you mentioned, collagen is to build the muscle, the the. And, and the cell, something like that? Yeah, I don't think they necessarily need to take above and beyond because your body can only use so much. So I would recommend taking, I would say between 15 and 20 grams per day. Um, and you can take that with a vitamin C to help improve um, the absorption of that. Um, so that should be sufficient for them. So 15, was it 15 grams? 15 grams of collagen every day? Okay, good to know. I know uh, as a technical athlete or martial artist myself, uh, full contact is just part of the game. Sometimes if you're not used to it, you, you get bruises all the time. So how, how can you uh, re reduce or uh, avoid the bruises? With the bruises, um, again, making sure that you have all of the right uh, sort of red blood cell ideal mm -hmm. ranges is important. Um, you know, because sometimes your red blood cells can burst open um, a little more easily, especially if you're low in iron. So making sure that you have, you know, I guess healthy red blood cells is going to be the key to that. Unfortunately, there isn't like a supplement or something that's really easy to help, you know, eliminate or reduce bruising. I think that's just some of uh, what comes along with the territory. Well, I really appreciate your sharing and your knowledge, you know, and your skills today. And I really appreciate that you actually really, really mentioned the tips, uh, the uh, theory behind it and the micronutrient or the supplement that we should take uh, at different stages of uh, athletic training and competition. And I really appreciate that you mentioned uh, for certain athletes, they may take more uh maybe iron or maybe protein powder or maybe creatine or maybe collagen. And that's all for today. And uh, do you have anything, uh, the last advice for the athlete and coaches before we hang up? <laughs> Just enjoy your sport. You know, I hope that everyone is enjoying either coaching or participating. You know, life is fairly short. So I hope that people are having fun with it and don't lose sight of that. Yeah, enjoy. That's really, really true. Uh, certain time at certain time when you reach a certain level uh, talking from my experience they actually uh, that when you don't enjoy you just you will lose the uh, the passion and I've been there when I did not enjoy my competition I actually wanted to quit I wanted to retire early but I endure on uh, because of your passion because you have your motivation so remember always refer to your 
why your purpose of joining competition and training of course you have your own motivation sometimes maybe external motivation and sometimes maybe internal motivation so that's all for today i really really appreciate for those who are listening and make sure you pay attention to what dr robbie uh was saying and make sure you check the description for more detail and click on the link for more information and i appreciate you and thank you so much and thank you dr robbie and thank we you hope sarah hi Take care. Bye. By the way, I, before I hang up, remember to share with your friends if you think this is really helpful. And remember to share with your coaches, your athlete, and also click like. And we really appreciate you. Take care. Bye-bye.